Hey everyone, this is Brian King Sharp, host of the Sasquatch Odyssey podcast and author of the brand new book, Sasquatch Unleashed, The Truth Behind the Legend. If you're into Bigfoot, extraterrestrials, and UFOs, you're in the right place. You're watching Ben on 401 Files. We deliver our papers, we turn around, we're coming back, and we're, I don't know, what do you think, like 50 feet from the stop sign? And so, you know, of course I'm hitting the brakes because I need to stop at this stop sign. And at the same time, Keith and I look just together. We look to the side and on the side of the bank, you know, I mean, we're out here, there are fields surrounded by trees and, you know, of course there's moonlight and things, but on the side of this ditch is this thing that's hunched over and it just looks like a hairy, like what you would think a werewolf looks like. That's exactly what it looked like. And it was hunched over and it turned its head and looked at both of us. And it had these, it had long snarly snout and like glowing yellow eyes. So I've just broke into this really like magical enchanted part of the forest, which is really weird because I've been exploring in this area for over a year. And it's a completely new part of the forest that I've never seen. So that always gets my mind ticking over. Like if I've just discovered this now and I thought that I knew this area like the back of my hand, I've spent many of nights here. I've spent many a days exploring and yet I've never been here. Never been here. So, oh, here she is. Where have you been? Um, Lily went on one of her her own little expeditions, one of Lily's notorious solo expeditions. Thankfully, she's found her way back. She's really good at that, honestly, like, it's, in all fairness, is that she does disappear every now and then, 15, 20 minutes at a time. But she always knows where I am. It's weird. Even if I move on, she'll know where I am. Um, but, yeah, this, this part of the forest, never been here. And it makes me think, if I've never been here, yet I've explored in this, like, say, two-mile by two-mile area, whatever it is, mile by mile area, what other parts of the forest, you know, have, have I still yet to discover? This is beautiful as well. Like, really, I'm not sure if it's doing it justice on the camera, but it's really quite, um, quite magical. So I'm just going to talk to you guys about um, a few things. I've obviously been an investigator now for many, many years. I deal with people on a daily basis that have been through traumatic experiences in their life, things that they're trying to make sense of. And it's difficult at times for me to understand and, and, um, and try to bring comfort to some of these people because nobody fully understands what they've been through. And it's the same with my experience and what got me involved in these genres is that I don't expect anybody to understand how I felt, what I saw and how it's affected my life there on after. It's just a personal thing that people experience. But one thing I will say is that these things are real. Um, you know, I've dealt with enough people now whether that be through email or personal encounters at conferences or, you know, just through the channel in the comments section here on the channel. I deal with a lot of people on a daily basis that have had their lives turned upside down by things that they can't explain. I do feel confident in talking about things um, that might signal or point to a very authentic UFO abduction. Um, and I'm going to talk about a few of those things right now. Um, and because there are misconceptions, okay, there's, there's many misbeliefs in this genre. And one of those um, false beliefs is that extraterrestrials don't make mistakes. Somehow they're flawless. This is just not correct. This is not right. I talk with a lot of people who have had an abduction case scenario where they've been taken from their bed late at night and returned the following morning, say like three o'clock in the morning, and they can't get in, back in the house, they're locked out. Which doesn't make sense because the key is on the inside of the house, lock, locked in the door. So, you know, that could be considered a flaw. There's been cases where people have been brought back and their clothes run back to front. It's almost like when these beings have conducted the surgery or the operation, um, which they intended to carry out, in putting the person's clothes back on, they've somehow got it wrong and put them on back to front. So that's another flaw. But my own personal experience as well, you know, when I saw this UFO back um, towards the late, towards the back end of 2023, so last year, just late last year, I had a UFO 
encounter, one of my, well, the only UFO encounter that I've ever, ever experienced. And I remember standing there as we, me and my brother, was watching this series of lights in the sky um, appearing and disappearing, very low in the sky. There was no other clouds. And the first thing I remember thinking was that whoever's, whoever's piloting this plane is very confused. Like, it's almost like they didn't know in which direction they wanted to head. You know, it was going this way, that way, back and forth. And this carried on for a while. And then all of a sudden, the lights just shot out to sea and they, they disappeared um, to what looked like the horizon from where we were standing, quite a way out to sea. And two fighter pilots, two fighter planes came screeching overhead, chasing out, chasing these lights out in the direction that they'd gone. So yeah, again, that's a mistake. They were, they were undecided as to where to go. They knew these fighter planes were inbound. They knew that they were being tracked on radar, whatever it may be. And whoever was piloting this series of lights in the sky was trying to figure out a solution, what their next move would be. And it turned out that they opted to fly out to sea very, very fast at a high rate of speed and vanished. Um, there's more to that story. I have got a video here on the channel if you guys want to hear more about that. But they do make mistakes, you know, they're not flawless. And I think that whoever you are, whatever species you're from, however intelligent you may be, that is just a universal law. We all make mistakes. Nobody is flawless. And um, yeah, so I deal with a lot of people, you know, a lot of, on this channel. I think sometimes people just assume that this is what I do. I just spend all my time creating videos, um, talking about the subject. And this is, a, this is a huge part of it. But behind the scenes, I do a lot of work with um, people who are suffering, really suffering with their experiences and coming to terms with them. Um, but beyond that as well, I also talk with other investigators. I've mentioned Justin here on the channel from Mountain Beast Mysteries many of times before. We always share um, conversations and stuff back and forth about our opinions, maybe even stories or cases that we've looked into. And um, it's an ongoing thing. It's an ongoing thing. These, these phenomena don't stop. There's no peak time of year. This is a 24 hour, 365 day, day a year job, you know. The phenomena can happen to anyone at any time and it does it really does so yeah um in fact i'm dealing with or i was dealing with up until about two months ago an elderly guy that had lived in yorkshire which i've always mentioned as being the hot spot here in the uk one of the biggest hot spots for ufo activity and strange phenomena um north yorkshire is is a really for some for some reason yet to be discovered it's um, a hotbed of strange activity. And this elderly guy that I've been in communication with for many, many months has decided to finally leave. You know, he's, he was born and raised here, but the phenomena will just not leave him alone. He, he's plagued by these experiences and he's decided now to take the plunge and move down south. But from experience and other cases I've looked into, it's not the solution. And I've tried to tell this to the gentleman that you're not gonna, you're not going to you're not going to run away from, from this, this problem, um, whether that be mentally, emotionally, or even physically. Because in many cases, the phenomena will follow people around. And um, I recently, not recently, but maybe two years ago, as part of the documentary that I'm working on, I did an interview with Steve Mera, a great guy, and Steve said it perfectly, you know, just like a paranormal case, these things will follow you around. And that is so true, they do, they do. And it brings me full circle, does that, into why I believe that maybe somehow, somewhere, these phenomena are all connected. There's a lot of similarities that cross over from the paranormal realm to the UFO realm, to the Bigfoot realm and the cryptid world. And we can just go right down the line and see um, many similarities. But yeah, these things are real. There are things on this planet right now here with us that we just don't understand. They're not in scientific textbooks. Um, we've not got any in a lab that I'm aware of. And if we do, it's not for people like myself and you guys. You know, it's, it's beyond the government. It's beyond anybody that we see standing in a, in a shirt and tie on the TV screens. These people are in the shadows and um, they, they rule everything. And, and I'm not trying to create another conspiracy here by saying there's an, an Illuminati one world government but essentially that is what it is 
there is a power beyond the power that we know who runs everything and they'll have all the answers um, to what is going on here on this planet. But one thing we can't deny, and if you do deny this still in this day and age, you've been living under a rock for a very long time or um, you're just so close-minded or maybe even scared, I don't know. But I don't think there's many people now left that would say, you know, it's all fabricated, it's all make-believe. So it kind of had like a trash cone can dome shape, but then the shoulders were really broad and really pronounced, like the deltoids and the, it was there. And when, and then you can see the shape of its lats when it stood up and that's, and I was just transfixed on it. I was like, what am I looking at? I had, I had no idea uh, what I was looking at, but I knew there was no mistaking that I was not looking at a bear. I mean, at this point I was like, you could tell this ain't a bear. I don't know what it is. I find it um, I find it really interesting how us humans can humanize everything. We always like to relate it back to something that means something here on earth to us humans. We try to humanize absolutely everything and I think we do that because if we can make something relatable, something understandable or you know can be compared to what we know here on earth as humans, then it becomes less scary. And the reason I'm going into this conversation right now is because I hear the word sexual assault being used in a lot of abduction cases. And I don't think that that's fair to use that word because it's a very human word and it comes with a, a lot of bad negative um, emotions. That instantly in my mind paints a negative, a negative image of these beings. It makes me feel a certain way towards these creatures and these these entities that are performing these procedures and I don't think that that is a good way to start. You know when we take a dog to be neutered at the vets, the dog is not walking around saying oh my god what monsters have been sexually assaulted, it's not saying that. Okay it's confused, it doesn't know what the reason for the operation was, but we as the higher intelligent beings do and in most cases it's for the bet for the good of the dog or ourselves. Um, it's not because we get cheap thrills or cheap kicks out of taking the testicles off a dog, you know? And so therefore we shouldn't ever say, I've just sexually assaulted my dog because I took him to the... It's not, it's not appropriate, it's not a valid phrase to use in that situation. And, and therefore again, you know, with the, the alien abduction phenomena, I hear that word being used a lot and I just think it's not appropriate. I understand and it doesn't take away anything from the impact it's had on the victims but we're not intelligent enough and we don't understand the reasons behind why they are doing these operations in the way that they do them. It could be for many good reasons, you know, they could be inspecting for tumours, they could be trying to evolve the human species to protect us from cancers and things like that. We just don't know what's going on and to throw the word around sexual assault because they've done something down in the genital area or, um, you know, it's just not, it's not a positive word. Um, until we know more about what their agenda is, what their role here on earth is, it's not a word that we should be throwing around. And if I had to write a list of possibilities why they're doing these procedures and, and for what reason, I think right at the very bottom, in fact not even on the page, would be that they're flying the vast distances of the solar system for cheap thrills, you know, cheap kicks because they're twisted, perverted, sex crazed, animals. I don't think that's what they're doing. <laughs> I honestly don't think that's what they're doing. Um, so yeah, this whole phrase of sexual assault during an abduction, it doesn't hold weight for me. You've been through a traumatic experience, you've had your life changed because of something that is degrading, but only on a human level. Only on a human level. Take on. studies people who say they have been kidnapped and sometimes sexually assaulted by aliens from space. A Pulitzer Prize winning author, Dr. Mack, believes that his patient's experiences are real and are not the result of mental illness or some other identifiable cause. His account of their stories is called Abduction and he joins me now and I'm pleased to have him here. Welcome. Good to be here. Uh, just, you, 
had to know that when you write about this subject, you are you are moving into a sphere of great controversy and great uh, incredulity. Um, no matter what your credentials are, and no matter how many Pulitzer Prizes you have, and no matter how many degrees you have, it is a subject uh, of enormous fascination, but also among a lot, huge uh, section of the community that's looked at that incredulity because of the people who say they have had these experiences no one ever sees any evidence so i don't think the camera's doing it justice but it's quite a big drop just down here uh, where the, the ground has just basically concaved in on itself i think it's water related obviously a lot of moss in this area that will soak up all the dampness and, and water on the ground. And then um, over time, I think it's just kind of collapsed in on itself, but it gives this really nice um, formation in the landscape. I can see that there's also um, a game trail that comes right down into this basin. You can't see it right now because it's obstructed by these overhanging branches, but just at the other side, there is a game trail where deer have been coming into this area back up through um, back up at this side, past these trees, making the way around, around here. So yeah, that'd be quite nice if I could maybe get a game camera set up here. However, the signal is terrible. Um, so it wouldn't be my remote controlled game camera. It would have to be the uh, the one that just you put out there. It does its thing. You retrieve it in a few, a few weeks and you've got what you've got or you haven't got what you've got. There's a robin there. There we go, guy. absolutely beautiful it's like um i always say this and i know that I drain on whenever i do because people must be sick of hearing it but it is like nanny right when the snow falls here you can only imagine especially with all this moss how this would look it's like another world it really is like another world lily's not too far away she's exploring and sniffing out the different smells or at least i hope she is because i can hear something moving through the forest <laughs> quite unnerving tell me how you got involved in this and why is uh, why is it of interest to you well, in this culture, evidence has come to mean some physical object that uh, we can measure, touch, uh, take photographs of and be certain of its pedigree, where it came from. But I suspect in something which is as unacceptable as a reality as this phenomenon, no piece of physical evidence would satisfy anybody. We'd be arguing that whoever found it was hoaxing it or making it up. But evidence can also come from other ways. Evidence can, in my discipline, psychiatry, and I played my strong suit in doing this, is evidence that comes from clinical discrimination. And what I found was... A discriminating look at clinical evidence. Th exactly. In other words, you, you look and you listen to what a person has to say about their experience. And you say, what could this be? And nothing in my... 40 years of working with people prepared me for this phenomenon. In other words, what people were telling me with doubt, incredulity themselves, no one has, in spite of what critics say, anything to gain, as far as I can tell, from this. Nobody wants to be a member of this club. 